standing when we are in Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Want to get your Bibles out? It was so simple I almost missed it. The large letters proclaimed that my number was one finalist. When I was a kid, I used to love to get the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes entry. Uh, didn't you, you, you remember that when it, when it came in the mail and, and you opened up the package and there were all these things in there? The prospect of winning a hundred thousand, you know, part of my life, later a million, and now you can win, yeah, the, what, something every month from Publisher's Clearinghouse was too much for me and my pre teenage mind to resist. Uh, Frank, I think my, my uh, brother and sisters and I fought over who got to fill out the entry. Because it was so fun. There was a stamp that you had to find, and you had to put it on the entry. And then there was a sticker on the other side that you had to, you had to go through, and you had to look through all the stuff and find just the right one. And then they had all those stamps with all those magazines. And you got to, you know, we never got to order any magazines. Mom and Dad wouldn't let us do that. But we got to look through them, and, and we looked through, and we circled the ones we wanted. And then the next kid would come along, and they'd go, well, I want this one and this one. Well, I'd like to have this one and this You know, by the time we got done, we would have had $100 a month in magazine subscriptions. So we never got to do those. But I, I finally convinced Mom and Dad that it just cost a stamp. It said, no purchase necessary. That was in big letters. We believed you had to make purchase. You know, you, you're, there was there. We believed that when they, you sent in your your thing, there were two stacks. There was the stacks with purchases and the stacks without purchases. Oh, look, let's mix them up. We'll pick one from over here. <laughs> the guys who ordered stuff got to win. Now, remarkably enough, one year we actually won something. I, I, I forget exactly. I remember it came in the mail, and it, it was our winnings. It was about $20 worth of stuff that we won. We won something one year. Um, we, we neglected to read the fine print. It was there. We didn't read the fine print. It said our chances of winning the million dollars, one in one billion. Something like that. Might as well have been yeah, something. Que sera, sera, as Doris Day used to say. <clears throat> Why is it that we fall so easily for the gimmicks and the hype? We all want to win the lottery, and yet we know that few people ever do. The chances of winning are greater than the chances of being struck by lightning. And nobody wants that. We try to increase our chances of winning by using a system. But the odds are stacked against us. Every time they're stacked against us. When we read the fine print, we understand how few actually win. And we come to this passage of Scripture, Colossians 1, 12-14, and it is sandwiched in between two wonderful things. There's, last week we talked about Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, and he wanted them to have this knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding, and there's power in that. And, and next week we'll look at the, uh, Christ and who He was and all that He was, and it's and it's there, and I was going to do that this week, and I went back and I read it again, and I said, oh, wait a minute. I can't miss these verses. It's the fine print of our standing in Christ. Here's the difference, I suppose. From the Reader's Digest, the fine print of the prize drawing tells us about our limited chances. But when we take the time to read the fine print in God's covenant agreement, we find the unlimited opportunity for us to be included. 
I think God's fine print is better. And the reward is better as well. Look there with me, if you will, verse 12. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loved in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. I want us to look at five words in that passage of Scripture. Qualify, rescue, brought, redeem, and forgiven. First is qualified in verse 12. There are a great number of events in life where qualifications are necessary to enter. A couple of weeks ago, I went home and I watched a little bit of the Masters tournament, golf tournament. It's uh, the first of the, the great big golf tournaments, and they uh, this one is by invitation only. You have to qualify to play at the Masters. Now in order to qualify, you first have to be a professional golfer or get a special invitation. I suppose there are some, there are some uh, amateurs who get an invitation because they've, they've done so well. But in order to be a pro golfer, you have to qualify to be on the pro tour. And in order to be on the pro tour, you have to qualify at one of the uh, qualification tours to get on the pro tour to earn all the big money and then hopefully if you're in one of the top categories you qualify to get an invitation to come to the Masters and play. If you want to compete in the Olympics you have to qualify. You can't just show up at the opening ceremonies and pay a fee <coughs> And that's my registration and my entrance. You know, when, when uh, they've got the 5K fun runs and the, and the two-mile walks and all that, you can show up the day of, and you pay the fee, and you get the T-shirt, and you can walk on the course that they've laid out. And you might get some water along the course, and there might be a, a lunch afterwards or breakfast before, and your entry fee qualifies you for all of those things. The same is true of heaven. In order to be permitted into the marriage supper of the Lamb, we have to be qualified. Unlike other human events, we can't earn an invitation to this one. This is a gift. Jesus said that He was the door, and the only way that we can enter into God's prepared eternity is through Jesus. When we accept His work on Calvary, we are qualified. Accepting the gift qualifies us. Paul mentions that a qualification, additional qualification we receive. It says, we share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Now isn't it nice to know that there's an inheritance? waiting for you, and you're qualified, if you've taken Jesus as your personal Savior, you're qualified to receive the inheritance. It's a great honor and a great privilege for those who were given the invitation. They qualified to play in that golf tournament, the Masters. It's an even greater honor and joy to qualify and share in the Master's inheritance in the kingdom of life. Whenever Paul speaks about Christians in the New Testament, he calls them saints. <coughs> You're qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of life. Now there are many people, uh, pastors, preachers, few sinners alike, they call themselves sinners. Well, I'm just a poor old sinner. 
sinners are those who have not received qualification. Sinners are those who still answer to the God of this world. Sinners are those who are still chained to sin. When we've been born again, born of the Spirit, we're no longer sinners. We belong to the other team. We've been grafted and put under contract for the saints. We're qualified because of that. To share in the inheritance. Sinners is what we were. Saints is what we are. Sinners is what we used to be. Now we are saints of the Most High. Now we've gotten that word kind of out of whack because uh, the saints, we think, are those special people. After they're dead, we, we, uh, we give them the title. Well, it's true that you have to die to become a saint. You just have to die to yourself and to sin and take on the life that Jesus offered. And you're qualified to be on the team of the saints. We've been added, given adequate powers, sufficiently fit. We are qualified to be included. Now, some would presume to be humble, and they say... Well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But isn't that the definition of a saint? You know, only those who have been saved by grace are saints. And all of us, the scripture says, used to be sinners. A saint is not one who is holy in their own merit. A saint is not one who has been examined and looked at by the powers that be and given a declaration. A saint is one who because of the work of Christ has become qualified to be included in the inheritance in the saints in the kingdom of life. And that is what you are if you do not turn away Qualified. Verse 13 says that we've been rescued. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Now who is it that needs a rescue? <laughs> is somebody who's been taken captive? Someone that's been held captive? Someone held against their will? Someone who has had a calamity in their life? Needs a rescue. God rescues those who who belong to Him. Jesus was sent to earth specifically on the rescue mission to pay the price for us to be rescued. Somehow it came to my mind in 1980 it was announced that President Jimmy Carter had sent a crack team of military troops to Iran to rescue the people who were held hostage the attack on the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. Operation Eagle Claw, it was called. One of the first missions that was ever attempted by the Delta Force. But it failed. A freak sandstorm, blurred visibility, helicopters broke down, there was an accident where a helicopter and a plane, transport plane, crashed into each other and eight soldiers on the rescue mission died. And the hostages still captive. When Jesus came to earth, he did not fail. The cross was there from the beginning. His death was planned from the beginning. He rescued us from the kingdom of darkness when we accept his sacrifice. His blood applied to our lives. We are reconnected with the Father, Creator of the universe. Rescue. We are qualified. Rescue. We are brought. And brought. That sounds like an odd word, doesn't it? How, 
what are we brought from? What are we brought to? What what are we brought? This word is is an odd translation in the NIV. Not only have we been rescued from the kingdom of darkness, we've also been brought into the kingdom of the Son that He loves. You know, once you've been rescued and taken from some place, you still got to return back to the place where you've been rescued to, where you've been brought to. When Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River, a voice from heaven called out, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. When Peter and John and James were with Jesus on the mountain, and the cloud came around them, and they saw there Moses and Isaiah, the voice from heaven said, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Son whom He loves is Jesus. Jesus, the kingdom of the Son whom He loves. It is Jesus' kingdom that we now abide in when we become Christians. He is ruling and reigning over His kingdom now. He's seated on the throne of power now. We don't have to wait until some future for His kingdom to be revealed. His kingdom, He said, is within us. It was the tradition of conquering nations as far back as the Assyrians. When they came and conquered the northern tribes, Israel, the ten tribes in the north, they packed up the people and hauled them off and brought them back to their king. When it happened for the southern kingdom, for the two tribes of Judah, the nations, and Babylon came and conquered them. What did they do? They carried off the king to Babylon. They carried off Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And then they came back later and they took even more of them and took them into their kingdom. They were brought into the kingdom of the conqueror. This is exactly the word that is used here for brought. Jesus has descended into the earth, enemy territory, and He has triumphed and overcome, and then He takes us with Him back into His kingdom. We've been brought back, living in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of His Son Jesus, now. We are already citizens of the kingdom. Rome used this same system. When they would come in and conquer lands, now they didn't do it to the Jews were unique. When Rome came and conquered Jerusalem and conquered uh, Judea, they just set up, a, a, it was a hostile territory. It was a weird place, a strange place. The Greeks had done it. For those that, when they came in and conquered, they carried a, a bunch of the people off and put them in their hand. Those were the people that Paul went and visited at the synagogues. Those were the people who had been carried off before. They didn't come back to Jerusalem. And when Jerusalem was finally conquered in 70 AD, the people who were left there were carried off. They were brought into the kingdom of the conqueror. We've been brought, transferred from one place to another. We used to inhabit the kingdom of darkness. But now we've been brought into the kingdom of light. Qualified to live in that place. Paul very specifically says these things about the Colossians, about us. The people of Colossae were under fire. They were being told that there was something lacking in their experience of salvation. That there was something else that needed to be done. There was another step or two or maybe a hundred or a thousand steps. They weren't to God yet. They just made the first step. They needed to make the rest of the steps. And Paul says, oh no, no, no. 
They've misunderstood. You are now already in the kingdom. You've gone all the way. There's no further you can go. Not that you can't be better. Not that you can't learn more. But your standing in the kingdom is as secure now as it ever will be. They were qualified. Certified. They could experience all that God had for His saints. Paul says, if you think that there is more to do to earn a greater salvation, you're sadly mistaken. That's all rubbish. Now he says it a nicer way. He says, you've got all that God has to give. We've been brought from one kingdom to the other. Verse 14 says, we've been redeemed. We explored this topic quite extensively several years ago when we looked at Isaiah chapter 42 and 43. Chapter 42 verse 22 says, but this is a people plundered and looted. All of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prison. They have become plunder with no one to rescue them. They've been made loot with no one to say, send them back. And then in 43 verse 1 it says, fear not, I have redeemed you. Jesus paid the ransom that was required. We've been brought back. God Himself has effected all that was needed for us to be redeemed. And just like taking the coupons to the grocery store and getting the dollar off for whatever product it is that qualifies us, God has redeemed us. He came and the coupon that was used to purchase us was Jesus on the cross. His blood redeemed us. Lastly, in verse 14, it says that we've been forgiven. When Jesus died on the cross, He paid the penalty for the sin of the world. And when we are willing to confess our sins, John says that He cleanses us from all sin from all unrighteousness, He is faithful. The debt is forgiven. The loan has been repaid. We didn't have to declare bankruptcy on our lives in order for the debt to be gone. Amen. It was paid in full. Jesus stepped in and paid the price. This allows the debt to be forgiven. It's gone. It's vanished. And we hold the title, qualified to hold the title, to be part of the same in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of the Son whom He loves. I could go on for hours and describe our standing before God. Many sermons have been delivered that extol and proclaim what happens when we're taken from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And if you want to know more, if you need to know more, I'll be glad to sit down with you. And we'll talk just as long as it takes for you to understand. I want you to consider for a moment that because of the price that was paid, because of the work that was done, because of the gift that was given, you and I have won the lottery of life. We've won what we could not earn. God doesn't stand in heaven and look over our every entry to make sure that we got this stamp and that sticker. The only thing He looks for is the blood of Jesus. And when
when he sees the blood. There we are. No other hoops are necessary. Nothing else to jump over or through or run around or do. If we've confessed our sins and accepted the shed blood of Jesus for the cancellation of those sins, then we are, you 